with us while we slow our way through and um, get through this as quickly as we can. Present are Ms. Grant, Mr. Judon, Mr. Morrison, Mr. Richards, Mr. Robinson, and Mr. Krawchak. Uh, from the uh, city planning staff, uh, Mr. Batchelder and Ms. Ashby. Uh, these proceedings are obviously being recorded and um, our procedure will be a little bit different from what we are used to. Uh, let me see if the ice floor goes two basic things. There are few decisions of the zoning administrator. We grant special exceptions, fact finding the board, and care in able to grant any various any various test is a hardship test. Uh, in order for the board to grant a zoning variance, it has to find that there are extraordinary and exceptional conditions pertaining to the particular piece of property, that these conditions do not generally apply to other property in the vicinity, that because of these conditions, the application of the ordinance to the particular piece of property would effectively prohibit or unreasonably restrict the utilization of the property and lastly, the board has to find that the authorization variance will not be of death to adjacent property or to the public good, and the character of the district will not be harmed by the granting of variance. Uh, when we have um, non-virtual meetings, uh, generally I call upon the um, participants to speak. Uh, we have shifted that a little bit for the virtual meeting. Uh, I will read the application into the record, and then uh, either uh, Mr. Batchelder or Ms. Ashby will uh, call upon the speakers. Um, the process uh, in the, the non is to uh, swear all the participants in uh, prior to hearing the matters, uh, because it is a virtual meeting, we can do that. So I will uh, have to swear in each witness individually. Also, our process of voting is um, going to take a little bit more time. We have to call on each member individually to vote. So it is a departure from what we are used to. Um, the uh, first item on the agenda this evening is um, 363, 367, and 369 King Street. It's uh, a request for the first one-year extension of a vested right that expires on April 3rd, 2020. Vested right pertains to special exceptions granted conditions under section 5411, which we would have to allow 9,139 square feet of retail space and 70 dwelling units. The property is zoned MU to WA. Um, Mr. Batchel. Thank you, Mr. Krawcheck. I'd like to just back up for a minute for the uh, and go through the the um, virtual meeting protocol. So this is uh, important for everybody to be aware of. Uh, staff will control the slides that are being displayed throughout this meeting. The applicants, staff, board members, and members of the public should give their First, give their name first, never speaking. Applicants and members of the public must be sworn in before speaking for the first time. Only attendees who have registered to speak before the deadline at noon today may speak during the meeting. Video and microphone have been disabled for all attendees, and attendees will only be given the capabilities to speak when they are called on during the public comment period. Board members who need to recuse themselves from voting will be temporarily removed from the meeting and then readmitted prior to addressing the next item. And if the need arises for the board to go into executive session, uh, they will call into a separate conference line and Zoom will be temporarily turned off until they are ready to return to the regular meeting. 
Uh, chat has been disabled for everyone, and this meeting is being recorded. So now let me move forward and pick it up back with the first item. Um, so this is a property on King Street just below Calhoun. These are the three buildings that front on, on King Street, 363, 367, and 369 King Street. But the properties are very deep properties. They extend well back into the block. And in this aerial image, uh, you see the facades right here. And the buildings stretch all the way back here. The properties stretch all the way back here into the, the middle of this block that is bounded by King Street, Calhoun, George Street, and St. Philip Street. So going back to uh, 2018, an application was uh, presented to the board for these requests to allow the redevelopment really of the rear portion of these properties uh, to accommodate a large number of dwelling units without providing any additional parking spaces. Right now, the property doesn't provide any off-street parking. It's virtually landlocked. Uh, by the surrounding properties. And, uh, uh, but it is grandfathered for a large number of parking spaces and uh, the redevelopment will increase the overall requirement for parking. And it was a shortfall between what was grandfathered and what was required, what would be required with the new development that the applicant was seeking the board's approval uh, of a special exception to not provide. Also, um, <clears throat> that, was, that was the issue, really. Uh, so uh, this went before the board, the board approved, not exactly what the applicant was wanting, uh, something a little bit less. The board and the applicant uh, appealed to circuit court and sought a mediated solution. Uh, to their uh, uh, application. That mediation was held and city council did approve a modified approval which is reflected on the agenda uh, with the um, 21 parking space special exception to allow the retail space and 70 dwelling units on the property. And that approval, uh, the, the two-year vested approval, uh, is set to expire. We requested this one-year of that approval. And uh, that approval was originally granted by the board with conditions that there would not be any short-term rental use of these units and that there would be an easement allowing pedestrian access uh, from the property into the uh, property behind it which has that uh, large student apartment building on it in order to allow access directly into the college of charleston campus and george street <clears throat> uh, this is a redevelopment that was um, that is uh, intended to be student housing. So uh, those are the two conditions that were placed on the approval. And our recommendation is for another one-year extension of the approval, uh, of course, keeping in place the same conditions that were applied to the original approval. Recommendation is for approval. And Mr. Batchelder, there's no one to who wants to speak to this application? There isn't the applicant in uh, Ashby. Yes, um, Mr. Krawchak, the applicant is Mr. Ramos. Mr. Ramos, are you here? Yes, uh, this is Steve Ramos. I am here. Thank you. Mr. Krawchak, will you please swear in Mr. Ramos? 
Uh, Mr. Ramos, uh, do you have uh, anything that you'd like to tell the board? Um, no, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, for the same reasons two years ago that we requested a parking special exception, those same conditions exist today, which are that um, parking on the site is not possible. It is completely landlocked and um, none of that has changed. Um, we have been making progress in the last 24 months since we were at the Board of Zoning Appeals and um, we are close to being able to continue that work. Um, in fact, the easements that have been requested with the neighboring properties are close to being finalized. So um, with that, I kindly ask that you all uh, extend the one year approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Ashby, anyone else uh, signed up to speak? No, Mr. Krawcheck, that is the only person. Uh, is there any discussion or any motions uh, that any of the members of the board uh, wishes to make? Michael Robinson, move to approval. Is there a second to that motion for approval? I second. Robin Richards seconds. And Ms. Richards seconds the motion for approval. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none. Uh, I would call uh, anyone, those in favor of the motion, please say aye, and I will call your names individually. Ms. Grass. Aye. Uh, Mr. Judon. Aye. Mr. Morrison. Aye. Ms. Richards. Aye. Mr. Robinson. Aye. And Mr. Krawcheck votes aye, since uh, it is a unanimous decision in favor and the Motion carries and the application is approved. The second item on the agenda is 19 Higgins Avenue. It's for a first one year extension of a vested right that expires on July 17, 2020. Uh, vested right pertains to a special exception granted on July 17, 2018 for a 250 unit accommodation use with conditions in a MU2WH mixed use to work force housing zone district. Mr. Batchel. Thank you, Mr. Krawcheck. So <clears throat> 19 Haygood Street is a property located just north of Spring Street. <clears throat> it um, includes the uh, building, the office building, uh, known as the Summerall Building. It was owned by MUSC for a number of years and uh, I believe has been uh, sold to uh, uh, the applicant who would uh, uh, like to redevelop this building into an accommodations use. And back in 2018, they received the approval of the <clears throat> Board of Zoning Appeals to do just that with a 250 unit accommodations use. And that uh, request was approved with several conditions. One, that construction traffic would not um, access or egress the property through the neighborhood uh, to the west um, <clears throat> or north for that matter, uh, that there would be 195 spaces reserved in the parking garage for this use and that the <clears throat> hotel or hotels that would occupy this building would provide shuttle service uh, to and from the historic district. <clears throat> um, and, and as I should have said in the original request, a vested right, once approved by the board, there's a vested right that lasts for two years. And upon the expiration of that two year, um, or prior to the expiration of that two year vested right, applicants have the right to request an extension of uh, that 
vested right by one year and they have the right to do that up to five times but they have to come back through the same process uh, that they used to obtain the original approval so that's the that's why these are coming back to you is that uh, uh, these two-year vested rights are about to expire and these applicants want to extend those approvals for another year and they can only do that by seeking your approval and absent uh, anything that triggers a, uh, a problem that's uh, spelled out in the state code and city zoning ordinance, uh, those approvals are really a, um, really sort of a perfunctory kind of thing where they're uh, automatic and uh, there are no issues with the uh, that would prevent this extension from being granted. So we recommend that it be granted. She recommends approval. Ms. Ashby, is there anyone who wishes to speak? Mr. Krawcheck, <clears throat> is Mr. Wilson here? I don't have from Mr. Wilson. Sorry. Yes, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Ashby, this is James Wilson here. Mr. Wilson, do you have anything to add? Um, no, sir, but certainly glad to answer any questions that uh, the board may have. Do any of the members of the board have any questions for Mr. Wilson? No questions, Mr. Wilson. Thank you. Ms. Ashby, anyone else? Uh, no, no, sir, no one else. So do um, I hear any discussion or any motions? Mike Robinson moves for approval. Okay, that's Mr. Robinson moving for approval. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Mr. Morrison seconds the motion. Any discussion? Hearing none, um, in favor of, if you're in favor of the motion, please say aye. Ms. Grass. Aye. Mr. Judon. Aye. Mr. Morrison. Aye. Ms. Richards. Aye. Mr. Robinson. Aye. And Mr. Krawcheck votes aye. Uh, by unanimous vote, the uh, motion carries and the application is approved. Item number three on the agenda is 411 Meeting Street for a third one-year extension of a vested right that expires on December 31, 2020. Vested right pertains to a special exception granted on June 7, 2016 with conditions for a 300-unit accommodation use in a MU2 mixed-use zone district. Mr. Batchelor. Sorry about that. <clears throat> this is a this is a, another request for a one year extension, and uh, this site is on Meeting Street. It's bounded by Reed Street on the north, Mary Street on the south, and <clears throat> um, this uh, once contained an apartment development. This site and that apartment development has been removed and replaced by just a surface parking lot essentially but um, when the approval was granted there were conditions placed on this approval by the board to require the applicant to um, <clears throat> keep or, or uh, rebuild 159 dwelling units on the property along with the hotel use um, and those 159 dwelling units would contain 231 bedrooms at a minimum. And so with those conditions uh, being extended, we recommend approval of this extension. So 
sorry, Mr. Batchel, I was distracted. Uh, did did you recommend in favor? Yes. Okay. Um, city recommends in favor. Uh, and uh, Ms. Ashby is um, helping me with leaving the room so I can't call on her quite yet. We'll give her a second to get back to her camera. Ms. What was the thing, Mr. Krawcheck? Uh, Ms. Ashby, is there anyone who wishes to speak uh, in connection with this application? Mr. Wilson is the applicant, Mr. Krawcheck. Mr. Wilson, are you there? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, this is James Wilson, and, um, and again, happy to answer any questions, uh, if there are any, but don't have anything I need to add to uh, Mr. Batchelder's Mr. Wilson, presentation. I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Um, I need to swear you in before you speak. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wilson, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Hey, Mr. Wilson, did you tell the truth uh, an application or two ago when I did not swing? <laughs> yes, sir, I uh, spoke the truth as well. And, and, I, and I apologize in advance. I have two more of these that follow. We I've, I've submitted all the applications okay. back when we were doing live meetings. And so I apologize. I am um, have so many items on the agenda for the first virtual meeting. Okay. Well, Mr. Wilson, I'm not going to swing in again. What time is it now? Um, okay, and, and Mr. Wilson, I interrupted you. Do you have anything further to say? Nothing further. Glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Ms. Ashby, is there anyone else who wishes to be heard? No, Mr. Krawcheck, no one else. Uh, is there any discussion among the board members or any motions? Mike Robinson moved for approval. The motion for approval is a second to that motion. I'll second it, Allison Grass. Okay, Ms. Grass seconds the motion. Any discussion? Hearing none, uh, if you are in favor of the motion, please say aye. Ms. Grass. Aye. Mr. Dunn. Aye. Mr. Morrison. Aye. Ms. Richards. Aye. Mr. Robinson. Aye. And Mr. Krawcheck votes aye by unanimous vote. The motion is carried and the application is approved. <laughs> Item number four is 317 Savannah Highway. It's a request for a third one year extension of a vested right Expires on December 4, 2020. Vested right pertains to a special exception uh, on granted on December 4, 2007 for a 150 unit accommodations use in a GBA zone district. Mr. Batchel. Uh, just a brief explanation on this one. The, the original approval day, as you can see, is uh, has been a number of years ago uh, on this application. And uh, just to give a little bit more background, the vested rights ordinance was uh, in that two year time clock was suspended by the General Assembly of South Carolina uh, starting in 2008 uh, as a result of the recession of 2009 and <clears throat> that suspension of the running of the clock lasted until December 31st of 2016 if I'm correct and so any approvals that were vested as of January 1st 2008 remain vested until uh, December 1st of 2017, or January 1st of 2017, I believe. And uh, so anyway, that's why this approval, although it's um, granted in 2007, originally is still vested. 
And again, they're requesting this uh, one year extension, third one year extension of this approval. And uh, we recommend approval of this. City recommends approval. Does Ashby, is there anyone who wishes to speak? Yes, Mr. Krawcheck. Mr. Wilson is the applicant. Okay, Mr. Wilson, you have been sworn, so you may speak. Sorry, I was muted there. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I do not have anything to add, but glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Wilson? Um, I, I have a question, Mr. Krawcheck. I, I'm just curious, in view of the extraordinary length of time, how much longer this property is going to be tied up with uh, this special exception, uh, or, or whether anything's going to happen with this or whether we're going to be back in another year granting another extension or, uh, you know, this is a very long time. Yeah, Mr. Wilson, do you, uh, can you respond to Mr. Morrison's question? Um, thank you, Mr. Morrison. Um, it's certainly a, a, a good question. I do not know, um, right this minute, we're happy, happy to find out and report back in terms of what the um, short-term plans are for development of the site. Uh, you know, what I can say is that our, you know, our statute and or, our ordinance is written to limit the number of extensions. And you're right, this has been a very long time since it got pushed out eight years by the legislature. But, um, but what I can tell you is that, um, you know, we are limited in the number of years that we can come back. So, so eventually you will, you will not Hear me, but but I would be glad to find out and report back for the board at some point if you if you all would like um, it, what the schedule is. I, you know, I don't know that's necessary. I'm I'm just curious. I if you knew, and uh, I mean the owner is the owner and has the right to leave it vacant if he wants to leave it vacant. I realize that, and of course it may affect his plans. That Waffle House has now been redone, has a brand new. Right, yellow lined parking lot. I noticed yesterday. <laughs> so maybe that that, that may be what eventually what pushes it forward. Mr. Batchelder, what if, what are the uh, maximum number of extensions that the board um, can grant? Five one year extensions, and, and that's state law. Correct. Any um, is there any anything further from the members of the board? Uh, Ms. Ashby, are there any other witnesses? No, Mr. Project. No other witnesses. Is there any discussion? Move approval. Move for approval. So Morrison moves approval. Is a second to that motion? Second. Okay, and Mr. Don. Seconds the motion. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion, and I'll call you individually, please say aye. Ms. Grass. Aye. Mr. Jadon. Aye. Mr. Morrison. Aye. Ms. Richards. Aye. Mr. Robinson. Aye. And Mr. Krawcheck votes aye. Uh, the motion is unanimously carried, and the application is approved. Item number five is 246 Spring Street. It's for a third one year extension of a vested right that expires on December 31, 2020. A vested right pertains to a special exception granted uh, on December 18, 2012 for a 125 unit accommodations use in a MU2WH mixed use to workforce housing zone district. Mr. Batchel. This site is on Spring Street <clears throat> between Haygood and uh, Horizon Street or Lockwood really. And the um, <clears throat> site was the location of an Arby's 
and uh, that has since been removed and it's just surface parking right now. Uh, but back in 2012, an approval was granted for this 125 unit accommodations use. Uh, and they're just seeking a, another a one year extension of that approval. We recommend approval. City recommends approval. Ms. Ashby. Yes, Mr. Krawchak. Mr. Wilson is the applicant. Okay, Mr. Wilson is sworn. Mr. Wilson, do you have anything to add? Um, no, Mr. Chairman, nothing really to add other than just in terms of the same question of timing of, of this one. Uh, as you all just heard, two agenda items ago, 19 Haygood is located right behind this. That property was acquired by this, you know, by the same uh, client and, uh, and was leased back to MUSC for a period of time. That lease has just recently run out. And so the development of this piece is being Sort of was being relooked at in light of the acquisition of 19 Haygood and which is right adjacent to it behind it and so um, so I'm just anticipating the question this that's part of why this was delayed thank you thank you sir Ms. Ashby anyone else no Mr. Karchak no one else is there any discussion There is no discussion of any motions. Mike Robinson moves to approval. Mr. Robinson moves approval. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Mr. Morrison seconds the motion. Any discussion? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Ms. Grass. Mr. Judon. Aye. Mr. Morrison. Aye. Ms. Richards. Aye. Mr. Robinson. Aye. And Mr. Krawcheck votes aye. The uh, motion is unanimously carried and the application is approved. Item number six is 28 Blake Street. It's for a variance to allow seven residential dwelling units with 1,466 square feet of lot area per dwelling unit, 1,650 square feet required. Zone DR2F, Mr. Batchel. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to just run through the slides that uh, show the information submitted by the applicant. Uh, this obviously is a map showing the location of this property on Blake Street between Drake and America. It's located in the east side. This is the application material. Uh, their statement as to why they feel that they meet the variance test. The uh, aerial view of the property today. Uh, it it's, uh, has residential structures on it from the front of the property to the back of the property and then parking along the west side. Uh, zoning map, it's DR2F, residential zoning. This is a view of the front of the property, uh, seven mailboxes, electric meters. Um, and here's a survey of the property. So the important thing here is that the uh, property provides 11 parking spaces, the required number of spaces for seven dwelling units. This is a, a survey, another survey, and a blow up version of that that hopefully you can read. It's a little bit fuzzy, but you see the front building has four units in it. The middle building has two dwelling units, and then the rear building has one unit. And then these are floor plans showing the layout of those units. So if I go back to this, so back, um, back in 2014, the city issued permits to construct the, the two-story building at the back of the property. And 
that was to be a new dwelling unit on this property. And, uh, and it was not to be a seventh unit, but to be a sixth unit. But somewhere the lines got crossed and the city ended up issuing permits and uh, allowing seven units on the property, uh, seven electric meters. And the um, property was subsequently sold and then resold again, I think twice, two times more. Uh, so it's it's gone through successive owners with the seven dwelling units being located on it, and the newest owner, the, the current owner, is is I guess requesting your approval to uh, legally uh, correct the discrepancy that exists on the property. So um, that's the history of the property. It does, like I said, provide all the required parking. Uh, and we, our, our feeling is that this is a, a somehow got approved by the city in the end and uh, built, and it hasn't been an issue for anybody. We're not aware of any ob objections or but one letter of support, which I'll read, unless uh, Ms. Ashby or anybody. I know the applicant would like to speak, and I can. I guess we should hear from the applicant at this point. Yes, sir. The applicant is Mr. Sharp. Sharp, are you there? I am here. Thank you. Mr. Sharp, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you go? I do. Proceed, please. Thank you. Just wanted to point out that uh, when my client, the current owner, acquired it, as Mr. Batchelder pointed out, it had been seven units for some time. Um, and we think that we're going to fix these units up, uh, convert them to a condominium, and by doing that, we are actually providing uh, affordable housing in the area. You have, as Mr. Batchelder noted, uh, a letter of support from the Simmons Foundation, which is next door. Um, we think that the lots are the largest lots in the area and that as the plats show, there is comfortably the requisite parking, uh, which has historically not been a problem for the adjoining landowners. I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Shum? Thank you, Mr. Sharp. And, and I think at this point, I'd like to just read into the record uh, the letter of support. So this is dated February 11, 2020. This is uh, a letter from Rossi M. Coulter, project administrator for the Philip Simmons Foundation. Uh, she writes that uh, this letter is being written in support of the South Carolina Palmetto Properties LLC, the current owners of 28 Blake Street, who purchased the property after the seventh unit was built. As owners and neighbors at 30 and a half Blake Street, we were witness to the construction and the occupants of the building. The tenants are quiet during the hours that we are on premises. We haven't noticed any unusual activity since it's been built. Having the extra unit there hasn't raised any noticeable difference. From the time when it was six units, off street parking seems to be provided also. Therefore, we support the minor variance that is being applied for by the South and other properties. Does Ashby, anyone uh, wish to be heard? No, sir. No other comment, Mr. Crotchet. Do any of uh, any discussion or any motions from any of the members? Chairman, I have a um, Lee, this is not in the short term rental district, is it? It's a it's in the short term rental district, but but it allow it well, it's not in the short term rental overlay, right? So it can be a commercial short term rental. It could be residential, but that means the owner would have to live on the property in order to rent one 
unit on the property as a short-term rental unit. And also, I should point out, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure about this. It might be an area where it would have to be listed on the National Register, but I'm not sure about that. It may not be. Any so, other? Sorry. Well, so this is Allison Grass. Um, Mr. Batchelder, since you brought up the National Register, and then we just heard from the Philip Simmons Foundation if it were to be considered short-term rental, going back to Mr. Robinson's question, would uh, the Simmons Foundation have the opportunity to speak about it again? They would have the right to be aware of the application and speak on the issue to us, but the approval of a short-term rental permit or a permit for a short-term rental unit is a conditional use and it's um, if a property owner is able to satisfy the requirements of that conditional use they are entitled to the permit. Thank you. Any further discussion? Do I hear any motions? I'd move for approval, Allison Grass. Ms. Grass moves approval. Is there a second? Second. You're done. You're done. Seconds the motion. Any discussion? Okay. In favor, please say aye. Ms. Grass. Aye. Mr. Judon. Aye. Morrison. Aye. Ms. Richards. Aye. Mr. Robinson. Aye. And Mr. Krawcheck votes aye. Uh, the motion is unanimously approved and the application is approved. Item number seven is 60 Hanover Street for variance to allow the reestablishment of two dwelling units duplex with 1,760 square feet of lot area per dwelling unit, 2,000 square feet required. It's for variance to allow a HVAC platform with a zero foot north side setback, three feet required. It's for a special exception to allow two dwelling units a duplex with three off-street parking spaces, four spaces required. Zone BR2F, Mr. Batchel. Thank you. This property is located on Hanover Street, just south of Line Street. So it's in the northern part of the east side neighborhood. And uh, zone residential, this is the applicant's material. This is the building in this aerial view right here. It's, it's um, this property. Back in 2017, the City of Charleston Board of Zoning Appeals granted a, the same requests that are being requested tonight. And uh, <clears throat> that was in July of 2017. And those approvals were vested for two years and expired last summer. So they were not extended. And I believe this is a new owner who has come along and would like to uh, undertake the restoration of the two units in this building. And uh, as you can see, this is a 2009 aerial. I think it looks worse today. Uh, but it was in rough shape back then, and uh, and it had been occupied as two dwelling units uh, for a number of years, and I think the, the grandfathering was lost. It might have been occupied when this photograph was taken. At least one of the units might have been occupied, uh, but but that 
grandfather non-conforming use of two units on this property was lost. Uh, the 27 approval was granted. And these are the plans that were submitted for that approval and that this applicant is requesting your approval. So it just shows the two units, one down, one up. The building was is configured for these two different units, has two front doors. Um, and uh, as part of the renovation, they would like to install the HVAC units back here. And that stand is what requires the variance for the platform to be you know, within three feet of the north side property line. And uh, finally, off street parking. It's a, it's very tight. I, this is a little bit misleading. We don't think that you can fit four parking, four cars back here and, <clears throat> and be able to maneuver in and out. So we have this special exception listed because we think that uh, probably a maximum of three cars can fit back there zoning requirements. So those are the requests before you. And uh, <clears throat> we had recommended approval of this back in 2017. And we recommend approval of it tonight. The configured the configuration of this property is as two dwelling units. It's been that used for many years. <clears throat> and uh, so we feel they meet the variance test. And the special approval Ms. Ashby. Yes, Mr. Krawchuk, the applicant is Mr. Langdale. Mr. Langdale. Mr. Langdale there. Ms. Ashby, I'm not hearing from Mr. Langdale. Mr. Valentine, do you see any recognition of Mr. Landale's presence? Don't I see two unregistered numbers. I felt them on the boat. Ashby, is there anyone else who wishes to be heard? No, Mr. Karchak. The city recommends approval. Yes. Okay. Is there any discussion among the members of the board? Mr. Any motion? Uh, Mr. Batchelder, um, if, uh, Mr. Krawcheck, if I may ask me one question. So I'm curious about the um, setback variance for the HVAC unit for the north side. I, I don't know what, what, where is the three feet that is in requesting for the variance, I mean, it's a, it's a setback from its own property or setback from the, from the, where, which set, where is the setback area? So this uh, site plan shows the location of this house on the, right on that north side property line. So it has a zero foot north side setback. Yeah. And they would like to place the HVAC platform I guess up against the up against it. Okay, um, all right. That that answers my question. That uh, I'm satisfied. I just didn't understand that because of that drawing. Any other members have any questions? I wish to make a motion. Move approval. And, uh, that was Mr. Judon. Morrison. No, but Mr. Judon seconds. Mr. John seconds Mr. Morrison's motion. Any discussion? Okay. In favor of the motion, please say aye. Ms. Grass. Aye. Mr. Judon. Aye. Mr. Morrison. Aye. Ms. Richards. Aye. Mr. Robinson. Aye. And Mr. Krawcheck votes aye. Uh, the motion is unanimously carried in the application is approved and that motion was for approval of both the 
variance and special exception. The next item on the agenda is number eight, which is 963 Battery Avenue. Special exception to allow a single family residence on a lot of insufficient size. Lot area is 5,524 square feet. 6,000 square feet is required. It's for a variance to allow a single family residence with a six foot east side setback or porch. Nine feet required. SR2. Mr. Batchelor. Uh, this is a property in the Maryville Ashleyville neighborhood. And uh, as you can see from this map, it's a corner property on the corner of Battery Avenue and Fifth Avenue. Oh, yeah. It has a very odd shape to it. Uh, here's another view. It is zoned single family residential SR2, just like most of the other neighbor other properties in the neighborhood. And the application materials are shown here. This is a explanation uh, from the applicant, their request. Uh, and this is a view of the house on Sycamore that is proposed to be relocated to this lot. So this is a vacant lot right now, uh, the 963 Battery Avenue lot. And this house sits right behind the commercial building that sits on the corner of Sycamore and um, St. Andrews. And uh, so they would like to um, move this house from this lot and uh, place it on that corner lot. And I, I believe the owner of this property is going to demolish the house, uh, but, but um, somehow they were able to work it out so that these other people could relocate the house and the house would not be demolished. So again, here is the lot on the corner where this house would be placed. And these are photographs showing the uh, grand tree that would remain in the house itself. Um, and here is the site plan. And this site plan does show the setback lines that are required with these dashed lines. <clears throat> and as you can see, they fit the house into the setbacks, except for the front porch, which is allowed to encroach into a front setback, but not into a side setback. Our zoning ordinance does have exceptions for front porches to allow them uh, to encroach up to a certain distance into a front setback area but we don't have an exception that allows it to encroach into a side setback. Uh, also, the rear porch, as you can see, goes beyond the dashed line. And again, we have an exception that allows that to be to encroach into a rear yard, <clears throat> rear setback as well. Um, so the issue is the front porch. And just going back to this view of this house, that front porch is an integral part of the, of the house. And so uh, without that front porch, the house really loses uh, an important part of its uh, fabric. And this is about preserving an existing house, an older house that's been in this neighborhood for a long time and by, by relocating it to this lot. These are the floor plans showing how the house will be renovated. And, and anyway, so that's, that's the gist of the request before you. And uh, again, it requires 
a special exception to the one to place a single family residence on a lot of insufficient size. The house lot itself is slightly smaller than the 6,000 square feet that is required by this zoning district. And then secondly, the variance to allow that front porch to encroach into the side setback and be six feet off of the uh, side property versus the nine that's required. Um, we have letters of support and non-support, so I'll um, maybe ask Ms. Ashby to recognize the applicant. Yes, sir. Um, the applicant, Ms. Reddy, is Ms. Reddy in attendance? Um, yes, I'm here. Ms. Reddy, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Go right ahead. Um, so I think uh, Mr. Batchelder did a great job explaining uh, our project and kind of our goal behind um, moving the house. I'd like to add one of the reasons why we'd like to keep the front porch as it is, is um, the ironwork on the front porch is Philip Simmons ironwork, which of course adds to the um, historic aspect of the house. And then the reason why we think this lot is appropriate for the relocation is because we feel that it fits um, the, the existing neighborhood and, um, and we hope to um, move forward with that and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Any questions for Ms. Ray? Thank you, Ms. Reddy. Ms. Ashby, anyone further? Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Johnson, is Mr. Johnson in attendance? Not hearing from Mr. Johnson. Okay. Um, we have one other applicant also, Mr. Krawcheck, and Ms. Cabanis. Ms. Cabanis. Oops. Okay, I'm here. Ms. Cabanis, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I also just wanted to add that Historic Charleston has provided a grant to relocate this house. So, it, you know, it has support is historic significance. Um, and I, I just think everybody ought to know that also. Thank you, Ms. Cavanis. Any, any questions for Ms. Cavanis? Thank you very much. Ms. Ashby? I believe I will ask if Mr. Johnson is in attendance again. Don't believe Mr. Johnson is present. I think I probably could go ahead at this point and. Okay. Uh, Mr. Batchel, I'm, 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 I am present. I'm just now getting unmuted. You think? You think that? Okay, Mr. Johnson, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Okay. Go right ahead, Mr. Johnson. Chairman Kralchek, members of the uh, board, I appreciate the opportunity to come before you and address the BZA. I would like to just add a couple points of context that this project is an affordable housing initiative being brought by the Charleston Redevelopment Corporation in conjunction with historic um, Charleston Foundation. Uh, so I know Ms. Reddy has already addressed the aspects as it relates to some of the ironwork and some of the other historical factors associated with this. Um, we did present the Neighborhood Association with correspondence and a copy of the um, 
application that's presented before the board. Um, the, we presented to the Neighborhood Association and one of the other letters of support that you have is from the um, president as a result of that meeting. I do understand and know that there is one member who was present uh, uh, at that meeting that is now wishes to uh, provide and has provided a written objection after the fact. But I would just point out that this neighborhood association is um, familiar with the BZA process. They are not um, an, 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 an unfamiliar respondent when they're in favor or in opposition of something. Um, so I, I believe that we come with the support of the neighborhood association as, as documented in their correspondence with the historic association. Um, and we certainly request um, your approval. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Johnson? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes. Does Ashby, anyone else? No, Mr. Krawcheck, no one else. Any, oh. discussion? Any motions? Oh, hold on. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Batchel. I, I need to reference the letters of support. We, we uh, were altering our normal routine and we're having the letters of support and opposition read after the people speak in support or opposition. So sorry about that. I, so I do have a few letters I'd like to enter into the record. So uh, one letter here is from uh, Miss Diane Hamilton. And I'll just read this real quickly. I'm Diane Hamilton and I wish to respond to Miss Higgins request. And that refers to a letter that I'll read that is not in support. Uh, the Maryville Ashleyville Neighborhood Association is very knowledgeable about the how zoning is handled in our community. We have appeared in person and with detailed letters about our position to the Zoning Commission, the Mayor and City Council, as well as Charleston County Council. We've had Mrs. Gianna Johnson and members of her department attend our meetings and explain about housing issues. Patrick King, the executive director of the Charleston Redevelopment Corporation, came to our meeting this year to explain land trust and to answer questions. Our three representatives from city council attend our meetings regularly to explain policies. Mr. Waring has spent many occasions explaining how the city operates in particular zoning and property related issues. This project will benefit affordable housing by removing an overgrown lot and preserve a home once owned by an active member of this association. Historically, this lot served as the home as home for the mutual aid society during and after the town of Maryville was created. Mm -hmm. Placing this lot in the land trust will allow it to continue to serve the, this community. My position is to allow um, the DZA to evaluate and give ruling, I think she refers to the Board of Zoning Appeals, evaluate and give ruling. A letter from the association in support of this project was sent earlier. It is not true that the neighborhood has not been informed if anything, they're probably tired of me talking about the topic. Zoning is one of the issues that regularly appears on our agenda. We meet 11 months of the year. Last year, we attended zoning hearings four straight months. Plus, I sent a letter, a written letter to the zoning board, as well as the mayor and city council dealing with frontage and lot size. My role on the board of directors for the Charleston Redevelopment Corporation is to serve as a direct voice to the board from our neighborhood. My primary goal is to educate the public and I start with my neighborhood association. My position on CRC is as an asset for the community because it gives me gives them direct input. Ms. Higgins said that she did not want to stop the project yet she cannot provide a description of the outcome she is seeking. On the day this information was presented to me with a detailed packet from Mr. F.A. Johnson, Eric Pullman and his staff presented with PowerPoint and entertained questions about zoning 
and property lines, frontage, etc. I've been working with the City of Charleston, Historic Charleston Foundation, and others to develop a specific plan to protect our frontage. For nearly one year, the association gets association gets a report on our progress regularly. As always, the floor was open uh, for discussion after my presentation. Last week when Ms. Higgins expressed to me that she still did not fully understand, I put her in direct contact with Mr. Johnson who spent nearly half hour, half an hour on the phone with her. <clears throat> Members of the community are always concerned and encouraged to attend public hearings and meetings so that they can get informed directly. If anything, I can be accused of giving too much information. I share whatever I learned from my various community service involvement with them as well as the adjoining neighborhood. And then I also have a letter from uh, Mr. Johnson, which I will not read because he spoke already. Um, position statement from the Historic Charleston Foundation uh, from Captain S. Pemberton. <clears throat> Historic Charleston Foundation supports the application before you tonight for 963 Battery Avenue for a special exception to allow a single family residence and a lot of insufficient size in the front and back rooms. The foundation has been working closely with the Charleston Redevelopment Corporation on a plan to relocate the historic house located at 912 Sycamore in order to save it from demolition. The new location at 963 Battery Avenue is an oddly shaped lot <clears throat> facing Fifth Avenue and is thus one that is slightly smaller than traditional lots in the neighborhood. HCF believes that the special exception request is a small one, and we believe the variance test has been met for the setback request. The orientation and setbacks are in keeping with the overall character of the Maryville Ashleyville neighborhood, and we urge the board to approve this request. Um, and then this is a letter just uh, from our uh, housing development officer for the city of Charleston, indicating that uh, the Charleston Redevelopment Corporation received the house located at 912 Sycamore Avenue West in West Ashley as a gift. The owner wants to use the land for other purposes. <clears throat> the CRC is related, relocating the house to 963 Battery Avenue, well, where it will undergo rehabilitation for use as affordable housing. Um, and that's Florence Peters, Housing Development Officer. So those are the letters in support of this request. <coughs> and then I have one letter in, uh, that is not in support, but I'll ha be happy to read at the appropriate time. Okay. I, um, Ms. Ashby, I don't believe there's anyone else who wishes to speak. No, sir. Okay, Mr. Batchel, I assume this would be the appropriate time. Okay, thank you. So this is from Marsha E. Higgins, 970 Main Street. Um, the comments are, the specific variance request as stated on the Board of Zoning Appeals Zoning Agenda, item number B8, was not presented or explained in a clear manner to the Ashleyville Maryville Neighborhood Association on March 14, 2020, by Mr. F. A. Johnson of the Charleston Redevelopment Corporation, or by Diane Hamilton, president of this neighborhood association, and also a board member of the Palmetto Community Land Trust. And specific zoning exceptions to property in the Ashleyville Maryville communities are not being communicated in a clear manner. As a result, this prevents the neighborhood from making informed decisions. Therefore, it is requested that the BZAV agenda item number B8 not be approved, or this issue needs to go back to the actually the Maryville Neighborhood Association. Why is it that we are denied the right to make informed decisions about our own neighborhood? 
And that concludes the letter. Is there any discussion or any motions? Um, I just wanted to clarify that Mr. Johnson did state that they gained support from the Neighborhood Association, correct? That's correct. Um, and I, I'd also like to say, I mean, it seems like an, an excellent project in terms of support from the Neighborhood Association. It's a public-private partnership. Um, restores affordable housing, and it also preserves, you know, the built environment, the historic character, grand trees, and ironwork by, you know, master craftsman Philip Simmons. So I, it seems like an excellent project to me. Yeah. And I would move to, to approve both the special exception and the variance, um, unless someone else has comments. Uh, Ms. Grass moves approval of both the variance and the special exception. Is there a second to Ms. Grass's motion? I yeah. agree. I'd second. Okay, Ms. Richard um, seconds yes. motion. Any discussion? Okay. In favor of the motion, please say aye. Ms. Grass. Aye. Mr. Judon. Aye. Mr. Morrison. Aye. Ms. Richards? Aye. Mr. Robinson? Aye. And Mr. Krawcheck votes aye. The uh, motion is unanimously carried and the application uh, is approved for both the special exception and the variance. Item number nine is one, three, five, and seven, Father Grant's Court. Court variance to allow a subdivision to create six lots that do not meet the required minimum lot size of 2,500 square feet. Lot sizes range from 1,275 square feet to 2,105 square feet. It's for a variance to allow six lots that do not meet the minimum 50 foot lot frontage requirement. Lot frontages will range from 23.98 feet to 49.84 feet. It's for a variance to allow lot one with a zero foot front setback, lot two, three, and four, a 1.5 foot front setback, lot six with a six foot front setback and a three foot south side setback, 25 feet, seven feet required DR2F. Mr. Batchelder. This is a property in the east side neighborhood. This map shows the existing four lots <clears throat> that are proposed to be resubdivided into six lots. They're located just south of uh, Columbus Street on America. Uh, here's the zoning map. There's zone <clears throat> DR2F, same zoning as the other property, most other properties in the neighborhood. And application materials by the applicant, their, their explanation of the variance test, and they're <clears throat> going to speak to me tonight so they can. Uh, go into this in more detail. Um, so this is an area of view of the property and uh, the four lots, the vacant lots, another view from the street, from America Street. This shows the reconfiguration of the lots four to six. And this is a view of the six lots showing the proposed houses on those lots and the driveways for the street parking. So <clears throat> 
So here's the existing four lot configuration. So this uh, this was approved, I believe, it was back in about 2012, uh, maybe earlier than that. It was approved by the city to be this one lot was approved to be subdivided into this configuration with a new court that would be constructed to provide vehicular access onto these lots. And each lot was to be um, developed for a single family affordable housing, um, affordable home. And, uh, <clears throat> But that never happened. I mean, the four lots have been sitting there. And now the city has uh, <clears throat> uh, rethought this and has come up with a plan to uh, resubdivide the property into six lots to uh, allow construction of six single family detached homes for affordable housing. And uh, <clears throat> that requires your approval uh, for the lot frontage variances, the lot size variances, uh, and the setbacks to allow the construction of these homes. Um, um, there are there would be seven single-family detached homes. Each home, as I understand it, would be a two-bedroom home. Uh, so that's a total of 14 bedrooms. And the property, or rather, uh, I'm sorry, would be um, a total of 12 bedrooms. So the property is large enough that if it had been developed in one lot, Um, it would be allowed to have 12 bedrooms and be allowed to have um, seven units on it with a total of 12 bedrooms uh, if they were affordable housing units. Uh, but we, we chose to go this route to do single family detached fee simple homes that could be sold to individual homeowners. Um, that would qualify back in about 2012. And, uh, and that's still the, the plan. These would be for sale homes uh, for people to own and, uh, and live in. And, and that's the goal with this project. So <clears throat> our recommendation for approval, we had supported this request back uh, when it was uh, before the board and the four lot proposal was um, was before the board and we, we support the six lot version. Uh, each of these homes is a small home but can fit comfortably on this lot and still provide uh, two parking spaces uh, on the yard in the yards and uh, and we feel that the uh, reconfiguration of those allowed seven units up to 12 bedrooms into the plan that's in front of you is a much better outcome, and a better use of this property. So that's our recommendation. I know that uh, I do have a number of letters in support and one letter opposing this, which I'll read at the appropriate times, but um, or summarize at the appropriate times, but uh, and I know we've got the applicants ready to speak as well. Ms. Ashby. Yes, Mr. Kwachak, um, the applicant, Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts, are you there? Mr. Kwachak, Jeff Roberts. Mr. Roberts, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, sir. Um, I hope all is well for you and the rest of your colleagues on the board. Um, to give you a little, little context on this, um, as Lee said, these are true affordable, deed-restricted houses 
that we have gotten involved in this on behalf of the mayor's office and the Department of Housing and Community Development as bringing our ability as expert developers and land planners to use it on behalf of the city and construct these proposed houses in an extraordinarily efficient and, and well-planned manner. Previously, it was in the hands of an extremely well-intentioned nonprofit who, who really didn't, I think, grasp how to efficiently design it. And, and that's what we do for a living. And we're willing to put that forth for the city as we, and, and Gianna's department, as we have done many, many times before to assist. So we think there are many extraordinary and exceptional conditions to this property, especially with it being a lane that, that is, is really carved in here and affords us an, a tremendous opportunity. Um, so we think we have extraordinary and exceptional conditions, which I can certainly go over more if there's any questions. Um, additionally, the property obviously is in a transitional neighborhood in the east side, and we, um, we could construct seven units here as a multifamily um, by, by right, but we, we don't, and, and those theoretically could have four bedrooms per unit. So we think this plan is a tremendous de-intensification. Um, additionally, <clears throat> we, the reason we need the, the variances is because it's zoned DR2F. The front house that you're looking at on America Street does not need a front setback variance to, to my knowledge. And I'll let my head of development, Patrick Head, who will speak after me just to walk you through this. Um, the front house on America Street, because it's got architectural context right next to it, does not need this type of setback variance. Um, but the other houses, which have no architectural context, and because the DR2 zoning requires a 50-foot setback, clearly we, we can't comply with 50-foot setback and do, because the lots are, 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 are somewhat narrow and, and obviously it's on a dedicated court. So for architectural efficiency and beauty of which Charleston's international reputation is architecture, and these are BAR zone houses, we need to design it in a, in a, in a way it comports. But just in the spirit so the board understands what we're trying to do here, we meet aggregate in the spirit and intent, we park the cars, we meet the aggregated side setbacks and rear setbacks required. They're all maneuverable. And we think as, as true deed restricted affordable houses, this represents a slightly over a thousand square foot, two bedroom, two and a half bath houses that our first responders, teachers and municipal employees can live in on an extremely well-designed um, well designed court and de-intensifies what, what could actually happen here if it was in a multifamily and, and we think fee simple ownership and in this configuration is extremely efficient and provides a, a great amount of benefit for the neighborhood. Furthermore, before Patrick Head speaks and just walks some of the technical aspects through it, we have letters of recommendation from everyone from the community association, from city councilmen who will be, you know, I guess Mr. Batchelder will, will, will read it into the record, our contiguous neighbor. Um, who is a nonprofit that owns that multifamily and many, many other people in Charleston, including, I believe, the preservation authorities. And our main ob and, and our one objector is, is a bit of a, a provocateur that does not live um, as, as anywhere near a contiguous neighbor and presumably has some, something on his mind. But that's neither here nor there. We have overwhelming support for this project. And um, if, if the board has any questions regarding the variance test, our corporate counsel, who is well known, I know to you, Mr. Krawchak and Mr. Robinson and likely many others in the board, Andy Gatter can, can walk through the variance test if the board has questions. So I'd like to, Penny to turn this over to Patrick Head to briefly explain the, the site plan and what we propose and in the spirit of which we're trying to conform to most all the variance and setbacks and, and, and parking and everything else. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Mr. Head, are you there? I'm here. Mr. Head, you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Proceed. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Krawcheck, members of the board. Um, just quickly, I will um, walk through the site plan. The, as Jeff mentioned, the front lot, um, it's shown up as a, a variance. However, I think we can line up with the neighboring properties on that street frontage on America Street. But as he mentioned, because the court has no other context, the remaining houses have to follow the prescribed 25 foot zoning setback. Of course, these lots are only 40 feet deep, so there's no way um, to do that, which is why we need that front setback. Both the side setbacks and the uh, rear setbacks are met, except on lot six, the side setback total is met, but for architectural design and location of the driveway, we needed to switch which side had the three foot setback. So that's where the, the slight change um, comes in. And as everyone mentioned, we went to a lot of trouble to make sure we could park all of these, keep all the cars off the street and fit two bedroom, two bath houses on, on the uh, sites. Any questions for Mr. Head? Mr. Head, um, this is Howell Morrison. Could you address for me, clarify for me, the side setbacks on the south side with your pointer? Um, I will try. I don't know if I can control the pointer. <laughs> um, on the south side, those, except for lot one and lot five, those are all considered rear setbacks because those houses face Father Grant's court. So that that is a three foot rear setback as required by DR2F. Okay, and so I, I just can't recollect what, what the neighboring property is there on the south side. So that's the court area, the open area? So the court is to the north and the south side where it says Mel Melvin Bailey, that's a house, a single family residence. It's actually a I think it's a double lot, so it doesn't have uh, a structure near our rear uh, setbacks. And then on the other two city of Charleston lots, those are, I believe, also affordable housing. So they're multifamily units. Okay, I think I understand. So is there any variance being requested for that? Tell me the variances again being requested there, if you will, on what I what I call the south side. Like uh, pointer is. There are I don't believe there's any south side lot line uh, variances being requested. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anything further for us to hear? Ms. Ashby? Yes, sir. Um, we have Mr. Gowder that's in attendance. Mr. Gowder, are you present? I am here, uh, Mr. Krawcheck. Um, good to be with you and, and the members of the board. Um, I don't have um, uh, much to add from what uh, Mr. Roberts and Mr. Head have to say. I am here um, available to answer any questions you or any member of the board may have. Gowder, in order to hear from you, I need to sway you in. Uh -huh. But to interrupt you, my yes, sir. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Gowder. Do anyone have any questions for uh, Mr. Gowder? Mr. Gowder, you're home free. Thank you so much. I'm still available uh, if, if needed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Ashby. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have anyone further who? Oh, no, sir. Um, I do not have anyone else that has signed up to speak. Um, Mr. Batchelder uh, may have some additional information. Thank Mr. you. Yes, I do. I have letters of support and I'm, I'm just gonna 
very briefly go through these. These are, uh, I have a letter from the Eastside Community Development Corporation. Dear BZA Chair and Board Members, the Eastside Community Development Corporation is in full support of the Father Grants Court Development. We always welcome the thought support and support thoughtful long-term affordable housing options for our community. Sincerely, Megan Flower, Eastside Community Development Corporation Secretary and Litter Committee Chair. And then <clears throat> I have a letter of support from Mr. F.A. Johnson, Dear Zoning Administrator, as an affordable housing provider, Pastors Inc. is pleased to offer this letter as evidence of our support of the above reference project. We support the collaborative effort to revitalize local communities, specifically in the east side. And then it goes on to say, as an advocate for providing safe, affordable housing, Pastors would like to support construction six single family detached homes as proposed by JJR development. Then <clears throat> um, a letter from Florence Peters, the housing development officer for the city of Charleston. Uh, development is a project featuring both affordable rental and home ownership units. The affordable rental phase of the development was completed several years ago. And the units currently serve individual and families earning up to 60 percent of the area median income um, and the city of charleston has collaborated with jjr development for the construction of home ownership phase six houses for individuals earning up to 120 percent of their uh, this is from council member robert mitchell i'm writing this letter of support and of the proposed housing development at 67 America Street, Father Green's Court. This item was approved by the Community Development Committee, of which I am the chair. The six housing units will be you know, an asset to this community. Also, please inform me of this letter. Then I have a letter from Councilmember Ross Appel. I hope this letter finds you well and right today in support of the variances requested for 67 America Street. I'm an ardent supporter of affordable housing in the city of Charleston. And I've reviewed this application period that satisfies the variance test and respectfully urge my PDA colleagues to support this application. Letter from Duke Willard, who writes that his, he is Dewey. Aaron Dewey Golub, I live at One Ann Street, Charleston, South Carolina. I've resided in Charleston since 1994, and One Ann Street since 2010. <clears throat> I also share with Councilman member of the East Side neighborhood. We find that our neighborhood in, of the East Side and Ragbrook are connected and a wonderful part of the community. Um, he's familiar with this application. And the six houses that are being developed by the applicant, which provide sensible ownership housing for police, teachers, firefighters, et cetera, who could not normally afford to live downtown. <clears throat> and very supportive of this application, they will create substantial benefit. Uh, this is from Catherine Madison, Business Development Client Relations Manager, Luxury Simplified. And Christy Jones, president and owner of Lux Luxury Simplified. Dear Ms. Ashby, I'm familiar with the zoning application being considered for six affordable houses. These homes will provide affordable housing, uh, having successfully received zoning approval and subsequently completed the building of four affordable housing for the Star Gospel Mission over at East Side at 83 Nassau. I have a unique perspective. And appreciate an appreciation for the process. Find the objection to the approval of the zoning, zoning application to be economically elitist and socially objectionable, especially in this current climate of high social unrest. I'm in full support of this application that will address a critical need 
for affordable housing in this community. Another letter from Kurt Gurr, the senior vice president of Service First Bank, 71 East Bay Street. Uh, I've been afforded the opportunity to work very closely with Mr. Jeffrey Roberts and his team for well over 15 years. Mr. Roberts and his team are extraordinarily talented and their projects have proven successful. I'm familiar with the zoning application being considered. Um, and, and accordingly, I'm, in, I'm recommending approval as a senior level banker situated on the east side in Marston Commerce, Urban Infill Collaborative Efforts, and other value add ventures on the east side. It is evident that this is another positive joint venture with Mr. Roberts. No one is more qualified for such a project. The uh, city can only benefit and uh, another letter. This is uh, from April Wood of the Historic Charleston Foundation. She just writes that HCF is in support of this application before the BZA and uh, Another short letter from Cater Sparks. Uh, I'm familiar with the zoning application being considered <clears throat> for the six affordable houses which provide sensible home ownership housing opportunities. Uh, very supportive of the application and I believe it will create substantial benefit for the community and the surrounding neighborhood. And this is from Cater Sparks, the former president of the Unionborough Elliott Borough Neighborhood Association. Another letter from Heather Templeton, uh, who resides at 69 Cannon Street. Uh, I'm writing to you as a 20 year single family homeowner on Cannon Street. Since living downtown, I've seen my many families pushed out. Um, I typically don't provide my support unless it impacts me directly or is a positive push for more affordable housing. I offer my approval due to the focus on affordable housing project at 7 America Street, Father Grant's Court. Uh, she writes that she's familiar with this application and I'm very supportive of the application. And Finally, another letter from Jane Harper Dollison, who is a sales associate with Daniel Island Real Estate. I am familiar with the proposed affordable housing development at 67 America Street. Um, and she writes that uh, <clears throat> um, that she represents the downtown office of the Daniel Island Real Estate and have worked with JJR on various projects in the past. My hope to city preserve the people who live here, uh, who have lived here for generations and felt responsibly for the future, uh, please consider this project. And that concludes all the letters and support that we received. Watch out, is there a letter in opposition? I do have a letter in opposition. This is from Aaron Pope, who resides at 109 and a half Hanover Street. <clears throat> this is a long letter. I'm going to try and get through it pretty quickly here. This letter was submitted an objection to the approval of the variances requested on 9 Father Grant's Court. I respectfully request this objection be noted in the record along with the included documentation as my testimony on this matter. <clears throat> in addition to the objection, I ask that the attached email from the applicant to me be entered into the record. Uh, and I have a letter, uh, uh, an email that uh, is attached that is from Mr. Roberts to Mr. Pope. <clears throat> uh, in addition to my objection, I ask that uh, uh, be entered. This email was received in response to a social media post I made about this case, this threatening, inappropriate. It seems as designed to intimidate. I would ask the board to consider whether similar emails were sent 
to other members of the public who had questions about this application. <coughs> Excuse me. The variance requests for the subdivision and waiver of setbacks for the development of Father Grant's Court should be denied. Evidence provide, provided fails to meet the standards required by both the South Carolina Code of Laws and the city's own ordinances. My position is not based on objection to affordable housing. As a former participant in the city's homeownership initiative, I'm well aware of the need for <clears throat> and benefit of providing affordable housing to homeowner ownership opportunities. Applaud Mr. Robinson for their willingness to apply themselves to this pressing issue. However, as a professional planner with 15 years' experience <clears throat> as a staff liaison to the Municipal Board of Zoning Appeals, I also recognize notable goals cannot be used to justify the variance. <clears throat> the type of relief granted when previously submitted there are no alternatives to development under this under the zoning rules. It is not a method to work around zoning constraints that are deemed inconvenient. Uh, I submit the following facts as evidence of the deficiencies of this application. <clears throat> A, there are extraordinary and exceptional conditions pertaining to a particular piece of property. The sole condition the applicant has submitted to the board to justify the variance request is existence of development agreement with the city. And agreement between the city and developer is not a permanent condition. It is nothing more than a legal contract that can be entered into an accident at will by an employer. Goes on to reference the 2018 Comprehensive Planning Guide for Local Governments. Um, <clears throat> describes extraordinary exceptional conditions of size, shape, topography, drainage, street widening, beachfront setback lines, or other conditions that make it difficult to uh, or impossible to economically feasible, feasibly use of the property. <clears throat> Now, these examples make it clear these conditions reference generally concern physical characteristics of land. Uh, the applicant has offered no physical, no evidence to support any claim of an actual extraordinary condition. However, there's ample documentation uh, that there are in fact no extraordinary exceptional conditions in regard to the characteristics listed in the examples of the planning guide. Um, subject property has no physical characteristics that distinguish it from other properties in the east side and has not offered any, uh, and the applicant has not offered any supporting evidence of such. <clears throat> uh, goes on to reference um, lot size, the, the specific request being uh, asked for and then see under the part C of the variance test, uh, the only condition cited in the application is the fact that the subject property has been designated for use by as an affordable housing under the development agreement. <clears throat> variance can only be granted if there are extraordinary conditions. And because of these conditions, the application of the ordinance would effectively prohibit the use of the property. Uh, two variances being requested would, would result in dividing four existing lots into six smaller lots. <clears throat> uh, and he goes on to say that the applicant has not provided any evidence to support the claim that this part of the variance test has been met. <clears throat> um, further evidence, uh, revisions to previously approved home plans these very lots unanimously approved by the board in 2017. Uh, the history of the site clearly shows that these lots can be developed without a variance. And uh, the fact that these properties were listed without selling could be due to the fault with pricing, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, authorization of variance will not be a substantial detriment to the adjacent property as evidence. <clears throat> contributing to the public good, the applicant lists the detail, <clears throat> the potential for multifamily development on this site versus proposed six 
single family homes. And Strack takes care to stress that this project de-intensifies the possible use of the site um, <clears throat> as affordable housing. If the goal of the project is to build affordable housing, why would the reduction in the total number of bedrooms by almost a third be a desirable outcome? <clears throat> this would be directly in opposition to the city's objective. The applicant also states that uh, granting the variance would be a substantial benefit to the surrounding properties in the neighborhood uh, while offering zero evidence to support this claim. In summary, nothing has been presented uh, for this review document hardship that justifies the variances to um, create two additional lots at this site. And uh, it's signed Aaron Pope. And that concludes the letter of objection. Is there anything further that you have, Mr. Batchelder? No, there is not. Is there any discussion or any motions? I got a question, Mitch, uh, Mike Robinson, uh, Mr. Batchelder. Yes. I'm at a lot fronting America Street that looks like it's owned by someone named Bailey. And was there no comment at all from Mr. Bailey? We did not receive any comments from him. The one on the, on the south side? Yeah, this one over here. Yeah. On the south side, yeah. We did not receive any comments. Mr. Batchelder, what are the extraordinary and exceptional conditions? I'd like to uh, ask the applicant, uh, uh, Mr. Gowder, to um speak at this time i think it would be appropriate if you have questions about that to hear from them mr. Uh, mr. yes sir i'm here mr crawshack thank you very much uh, i think the extraordinary exceptional conditions are is are the size uh of the lots um in conjunction with the location of them on this uh court or lane so they're they're facing internally um, as opposed to out onto America Street. So in order to, for the, um, uh, for the houses to be able to be uh, located on these small lots in that configuration, uh, I think the, um, both the side setback um, variances and the, um, the lot size variances uh, are necessary uh, particularly in conjunction with the um, deed restrictions. So if they're going to be single family, affordable, owner occupied units uh, on these small lots in this configuration on this lane, that those would be the, the exceptional circumstances. Thank you very much. Anyone have any further questions for Mr. Gowder? Thank you, Mr. Gowder. Thank you. Uh, any of the members of the board have any comments, uh, suggestions, discussion, motions? Okay, do I hear a motion? Yes. This is how I'll move approval, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Mr. Morrison moves approval. Is there a second to his motion? No second it. This is um, Allison Grass. Ms. Grass seconds the motion. Any discussion? Okay, there's a motion for approval. If you're in favor of the motion, please say aye. Ms. Grass. Aye. Mr. Judon. Mr. Judon. Aye. Mr. Morrison. Aye. Ms. Richards. Aye. Mr. Robinson. Aye. And Mr. Krawcheck votes aye. 
the uh, motion is unanimously carried and the application is approved. Item number 10 is 36 South Street, special exception to allow a two-story addition, storage, kitchen, expansion, bedrooms, baths, that extends a non-conforming three foot, eight inch west side setback, seven feet required DR2F. Mr. Pacho. This is enough. <clears throat> Excuse me, this is another residential property in the east side. <clears throat> this has a house on it, and uh, here's the lot on South Street, just <clears throat> west of America Street. Um, this has a house on it. The footprint is shown here in this photograph, or this uh, map. <clears throat> and uh, here's an aerial view of the lot. Large backyard. Here's the application materials. These are photographs showing the house. So it's a house that's in poor condition, but um, proposed to be fixed up. And, uh, and as part of the effort to improve this house, um, they want to, uh, the applicant wants to construct an addition onto the back. And uh, I think uh, if I recall correctly, we had approved the location of the addition. These are existing floor plans, uh, existing. Here's the proposed addition. You can see it's this large uh, addition on the back of the house. <clears throat> and I think we had approved an addition on the back. <clears throat> and I think it was going to be placed over, over here and meet the setback requirements, but the BAR <coughs> asked that they shift the addition over so it was more centered on the, uh, on the back of the house and, and therefore clearly distinguishable from the original uh, historic uh, building up front. And <coughs> by doing that, that meant that the addition would be would be uh, moved into a setback, a required building setback, and and thus the application before you seeking the the variance to allow this addition or special exception rather, um, and this is a special exception um, that uh, is really applicable based on light and air impacts on the adjoining property. Um, and uh, um, we have not, to the best of my knowledge, and Ms. Ashby, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe we received any um, information from anyone uh, raising any objections or concerns to this request. Uh, this shows in more detail the uh, originally approved, um, zoning approved uh, addition and the the revised location and more information here, more information. So it's it's really a question of what what are the light and air impacts on the adjoining property and, and is that adjoining property owner going to uh, object? And I don't believe we received anything indicating that they would object to this. And I don't believe I have any letters in support for objecting to this. So, um, so we're in support of this request. Um, and I believe there may have been a hearing in front of the BAR already on this proposal, um, but the applicant could correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, Mr. Batchelder, you are correct. Um, we, I have not received any um, communications of opposition to this request. Um, the applicant is Ms. Looney. Is Ms. Looney in attendance? Yes, I'm here. Looney, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? 
I do. Um, so I just want to clarify a, a couple of points. Um, the addition on the back is um, reestablishing some square footage that will be um, lost to the homeowner when we reestablish the front piazzas, which are currently enclosed. Um, and as uh, Lee mentioned, the addition in the back would, was originally designed to um, comply with setbacks. Um, and I don't, do I have control of the? No, but I, if you tell me, I can go. If you'll go back to the um, original condition photographs, Lee. And I'll show you where the germ of this um, idea came from. Um, it's small, but that the red footprint in that 1953 Sanborn there, um, you can see that there is an addition on the back that um, is along that west side um, lot line. And so the BAR has requested that we move our addition to be more in line with that historic addition. Um, one additional point is that the house most impacted is the house immediately to the west, um, and that is actually owned by the same client. That's their current residence. So the, they are the people most impacted. So does anyone else have any questions? Any questions for Ms. Looney? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Does Ashby anybody else? No, Mr. Krawcheck, no one else. Okay, Are there, is there any discussion or any motions? I just have one question, sorry. I was trying to find the slide. Um, so there was no response from the Neighborhood Association. Was there any communication? Mr. Batchelder? I'm not aware of any response and perhaps the applicant can provide any more information on that. Ms. Looney is on. Ms. Looney, any, um, any response from the Neighborhood Association? Um, I had emailed them when we originally put in the application after the BAR um, made the recommendation and I um, let them know that we were on the agenda again last week um, and they were in support of it. I apologize if that didn't get forwarded to y'all. Thank you. Further discussion? Any motions? I recommend approval, Robin Richards. Ms. Richards moves approval. Is there a second to that motion? Mr. Judon. Mr. Judon seconds the motion. Any discussion? If you're in favor of the motion, please say aye. Ms. Grass. Aye. Mr. Judon. Aye. Ms. Morrison. Aye. Ms. Richards. Aye. Mr. Robinson. Aye. And Mr. Krawcheck votes aye. Uh, the motion is unanimously carried and the application for the special exception is unanimously approved. The last item on the agenda is item 11. It's 34 Savage Street. It's for a special exception to allow a vertical extension, a second story exercise office to a non-conforming building with a six inch north side setback and a zero foot rear setback, three and 25 feet required. It's for a variance to allow an elevator stair landing addition with having a 55% lot occupancy, 50% limitation, existing lot occupancy, 52% zone DR. Mr. Batchel. So I'll run through this. This is the location of the property in question, mid block on Savage Street, just south of Broad. <clears throat> Here's a zoning map roughly showing the footprint of the existing house and a shed at the back of the property. Another view of the existing house. Application materials. 
explanation from the applicant and sandborn maps that show the how the house changed over time 1902 sandborn map in this uh, upper left corner then it goes to uh, 1944 in the upper right corner here then 1951 in the lower left. And finally, 19, oh, oh, yeah, 1955, I'm sorry, in the uh, lower right. Photographs of the existing uh, property. And you can see this is the one story shed that is at the back of the property right now. And that would be removed and replaced by a new building addition. So here's a survey showing the existing property with the house all the way at the front of the property and extending back into the lot along the north side property line. And then the shed, the one story shed This is a that the applicant submitted showing the uh, one and two, one and a half and two story dependencies in close proximity of the lot line. Can you, I'm sorry, can you put your arrow on those? Well, and so that would be this red color right here, one and one and a half and two story dependencies in close proximity to the lot line. Okay, I see. And that Red indicates all the properties that they've identified with those. <clears throat> and these are the properties immediately around 34 Savage Street. So you see 34 Savage Street properties to the north and the south, 36 and 32 Savage. And then here's one um, back at 20 New Street. Um, more information on those properties that's around this. This one. We'll let the applicant go through this in more detail if she would like. Uh, lots more detailed information about other surrounding properties. More detailed information. And finally, the plans. So this is the existing at the top. One story shed back here. And this is the proposed. So this one story uh, CMU building goes away and gets replaced by a new addition. And here is the additional footprint right here that generates the need for the lot occupancy variance and it includes this elevator, stair and landing. <clears throat> I do feel that the main issue is not so much the the elevator stair and landing addition that that uh, creates the need for the variance to increase the lot occupancy um, from fifty two to fifty five percent. I think the bigger issue is the special exception, and that is the special exception that um, in this area right here. So the <laughs> detailed view. <clears throat> this is the one story shed at the top. And then here is the proposed addition that replaces that one story shed. It's, it's connected to the house. And what they've done, so here's the property line right here. This, this red line, dashed line is the property line. And then the setback line is this black dashed line that runs all the way back, paralleling that north side property line, turning and running parallel to the rear property line. The setbacks on the north side <clears throat> and the rear property uh, line are, are three feet. Three Building has to be set back three feet. Well, obviously the shed is not set back three feet, so that's non-conforming and what they'd like to do 
is um, build back and, and uh, in the same footprint as the existing shed, and then build a connection to that addition that will be set back and meet that three foot setback requirement right here. And then, uh, so this is existing second floor. There is no second floor right now, um, at least in that location. I think it, there's also a change maybe up, up, up here, but also there's a second floor addition on top of the, of uh, that rear portion, that rear one story section that gets replaced. And this, upper level, the second floor is set back to meet the three foot setback. So again, here's the existing roof plan, existing house up here, shed in the back, rear dependency or rather, and this is the proposed. An elevation, Here's what it looks like. So you have that one story building back here, replaced by this two story addition. But again, it doesn't extend back. The second floor doesn't extend all the way back to the uh, property line. And on the north side, it is set back. So this wall on the ground floor is on the property line. This wall above is three feet off of that north side property line. And then here is the connection between the two that doesn't presently exist. And here's the rear elevation showing that change from what is there today to what's proposed here. So you see the north wall of that uh, replacement building and then stepping in three feet to the north wall of the second floor. And these are more perspective views help you to understand what they're proposing. And <clears throat> light study that the applicant has submitted and additional light study information that they can refer to if they, if need be. And then more information that, uh, for them to explain how they meet the requirements in detail. So, um, <clears throat> this is, a. They, they originally applied for a two-story addition that would go and replace that one-story building and follow the same uh, zero-foot north side setback as the existing one-story building and, and house. And, and I, I felt like that was just too much. That would create too much impact. I didn't feel comfortable supporting that. I uh, didn't really know where stood with the neighbors, but I, I felt like that was too much. So I, we asked the applicant to go back and we study that and see if they could alter their plans and re reduce the impact. Um, and they came back with these revised plans where they've that pulled in the, the proposed second floor addition and pulled in the, the uh, connecting point between those two sections of buildings. And so I'm inclined to be supportive of this, but I still don't know for sure exactly how all the neighbors feel about this. And, and so um, I'm leaving myself open. I'd like to hear because uh, I think we do have some folks that do want to speak to the board about this, and uh, I'd like to let them uh, 
take their position, also give the applicant a chance to um, make her case. But um, um, I do have a letter of non-support from the Preservation Society and letters of support, I believe, these are supportive uh, from some of the neighbors. Um, so with that, I will conclude my remarks. Ashby. Yes, Mr. Krawcheck, the applicant, um, Ms. Fenno, is she in attendance? Ms. Fenno. Yes, I'm here. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Okay, proceed, Ms. Fenno. Uh, thank you, Mr. Batchelder. I appreciate that overview of the project. Um, yes, we. this project honestly is uh, really the result of speaking with our neighbors from about December until we applied in March uh, for this project. Um, so we were extremely um, diligent and, and really interested in the view of the project from our neighbor's properties to the north, uh, on Sa north and south on Savage Street, as well as to the east on New Street. Um, I do want to clarify, I want to be a little bit more forceful with the way the design evolved. And this is a perfect view to look at it on the top right. Our, our intent our intent is really to maintain that existing dependency uh, on the ground floor, at least the two walls uh, on the north and east that we're looking at that have mature vine on it. Um, that's really a lovely feature in the neighboring properties. Uh, and we have committed to those owners that we um, or are going to maintain those two walls. So that first floor volume is really the volume of the existing dependency. And then the second floor honestly really evolved from um, responding to them. Uh, you can see on the uh, right hand or north wall, that, that wall is set back to the three foot setback. Uh, and then the wall facing us that has a, a false shuttered opening is set back five feet from the house at, at 17 New Street. Um, and, and the height of it really is very compressed. Uh, we are doing really an eight foot ceiling height on both floors to really bring that volume down as low as we can. Um, and there's also in the record uh, attention to the magnolia tree that is there. We've had an arborist look at that and uh, confirm that that will, will still thrive and be fine during our project. Um, I would like maybe to go back to the site plan. I, I don't want to repeat too much. I know you guys have been here a while. I just want to say about the initial study of Savage Street and the dependencies, uh, we really did that extensive, extensive study simply to verify that this, this project was appropriate, that really to, to attach to the dependency and in the way that we are doing was really appropriate for the neighborhood. And we did feel that was the case. Uh, there, is, there are such dependencies on both neighboring properties. Uh, and throughout the immediate neighborhood. Um, Lee, could you, yeah, could I go, uh, maybe the first floor plan? Oh. I, can, I, I don't think I need to recap the, uh, the, the study unless somebody would like me to. This so the, fir the first floor plan actually also kind of shows the site plan. So here we are showing actually I'm, I'm going to be a little more forceful and say we're really using the first floor of the existing dependency. Uh, so really this, the intent is that the new work on this floor is the hatched area. And that is the uh, hyphen, which has the elevator and the connection from the family room on the left to the mud room on the right. And then the, uh, the stair and uh, the, the stair at the bottom saw new stair to access the mudroom 
is hatched because it is covered by the second floor, which basically shifted away from the neighbor on the north and away from the neighbor on the east. Uh, so that's, um, that's our, our scope of work on the first floor is really meeting the north setback, three foot setback, and just maintaining those existing walls in their non-conforming position. Uh, and then if we go to the next floor, you'll see that, so the second floor, uh, as we spoke to all the neighbors, we made adjustments to the project on this floor where we, where we pulled away from the north property line to meet the three foot setback there, thank you. And then on the east, we came to a, um, a solution with Peter and Annette Manny who live at 17 New Street to the right uh, in, in looking at the, the project a, a couple times from their property. And we decided that pulling it back five feet and really keeping the height low was, was a, uh, a good solution. And they uh, have no objections to the project. And then if we go to uh, the next sheet, which is the roof plan, you'll see that we're moving the HVAC units uh, from between the two buildings up onto the roof of the hyphen. And we'll be, of course, shielding those from, uh, from view as is appropriate. And then you can see the roof form of the new second floor on the right uh, and the existing dependency that's, that's down below it. And then if we go to the next sheet, which is the south elevation facing our owner's driveway, uh, with New Street, the New Street properties to the right. You'll see um, we're trying to maintain that volume of the dependency. Um, if let's work from left to right, there's the main house, then there's the hyphen with the elevator. Again, kept as low as we possibly can to get the elevator in there. Uh, and then to the far to the right is uh, the second floor added on top of the dependency. And then at the very far right is the remainder of the dependency. Uh, and, and we're holding our new work again back five feet from that property line with the new street home. Uh, uh, so it's kind of a typical downtown situation where you start to step back, step down as you move toward the rear of the site. And then if we go to the next elevation, which faces uh, which is our north elevation and faces uh, Miss Lewis at 36 Savage. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Thank you, Lee. Uh, this is the north elevation. Again, I want to I want to state that we are um, committed to. Um, again, Miss Lewis has a wonderful vine on that existing wall there. We are maintaining that first level of the dependency and then adding above that, but setting three feet back from her. So meeting the setback on Miss Lewis's side. And then again, you can see on the left is, would be the new street property and we're setting the new work back five feet from that. And then if we go to the next one, which is the very rear elevation facing 17 new street, uh, again, we're maintaining the gable end of the dependency with the mature vine, which is actually beautiful on their property. Um, we're, we're thankful that for the time they spent with us to be able to take a look at this. And then we agreed to set the, our new wall back and it'll have a false opening with shutters to add a little bit of scale. Uh, but it is, we've kept it as low as we possibly can. You can see the low pitch on that roof to really uh, try to keep the impact on any of these properties at a minimum. I think the uh, last, the next page really is the perspectives that we've already seen. And then if we go to the last two pages, uh, we did study, it was important to us to study uh, any effect that we might be having on the sunlight on Miss Lewis's property at 36 Savage. And this, we had the opportunity, this was February before we, right before we submitted. And really uh, by 11 o'clock in the morning, even now in the existing condition, uh, her, her garden and her yard is shaded. 
So when we ran the computer model for sun study, there was very little change to the winter sun uh, on her property. And then the last page is showing summer sun where uh, there at 12 o'clock and one o'clock, I'm sorry, the existing is on the top and then the proposed is on the bottom. And then, and there is minimal change to the sunlight on her property at 12 and one. And then after that, the computer model shows no change uh, to that sun pattern. Um, I do want to say that we have uh, a letter of support from 32 Savage to the south. Uh, we have a letter of support from um, Elizabeth and Richard Rubin at 15 New Street, which is to the east or to the right. Uh, and Peter and Annette Manny uh, have, no have submitted a letter of no objections. Uh, they're also to the right uh, or to the east. Uh, we had numerous meetings with Miss Lewis at 36 Savage um, and really have no comment from her. I, d I do have the comment from Preservation Society um, and I do want to clarify again, we are not doing a vertical extension of what's existing. On, on Miss Lewis's side, we are actually meeting the three foot setback with our new work. So that is in response to a letter that you'll hear momentarily. I think I think that might have been enough. <laughs> Are there any questions? Questions for Ms. Fano? Um, I, I think I heard Ms. Fano say this, but uh, the neighbor to the west, I think, maybe is 32 Savage at Gouldens, and you have a letter of support from them? Yes, yes, we do. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ms. Ashby, anyone else want to be heard? Um, Mr. Shin. Mr. Shin. I'm not seeing Mr. Shin. Okay. Um, Mr. Lighter Sleeve. Is he present? Uh, Mr. Kratcha, Gary Gildersleeve, I'm here. Gildersleeve, yes, sir. Nice to meet you. Yes, sir. Um, thank you very much. For the Sorry, Gildersleeve, before you talk, let me sway you in. Sure. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Yes, I do. Proceed. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, I think uh, Ms. Fenno covered much of what I was going to say. What I would like to say, though, is that uh, my wife, Carolyn, and I bought this property nine years ago after a two year search for a house. Uh, we are very much looking forward to being part of the Charleston community and contributing to the Charleston community. Um, one of the things that attracted us to Charleston is its history. And another part is its architecture. And I have to say just very, very strongly that uh, I would not be interested in any kind of renovation if it were to impact in any way the historical uh, part of this building or the community. Um, I'm also a supporter of the Preservation Society, which I think uh, backs up what I'm just saying. But um, we are not, as, as um, Becky explained, we uh, have reached out to Peggy. We have met with her, that's Miss Lewis, uh, to our north. And um, I think we have met her concerns and are not aware that there are any at this point. So 
that's really all I have to say. And we are looking forward to coming down to Charleston. Any of the members have any questions for Mr. Gildersleeve? Thank you, sir. Ms. Ashby, anyone else? Um, not to, uh, to my knowledge, Mr. Krawcheck, unless Mr. Shin has now joined us. Mr. Shin, are you there? He is not, Ms. Ashby. Um, Mr. Batchelder, do you have anything further? No, I can just say that I, I have the copies of the letters that Ms. Fenno referenced that are in support. And then I do have, um, I do have this uh, letter of non-support from the Preservation Society, which I'll just briefly read. So this is from Aaron Minigan, Director of Historic Preser Preservation for the Preservation Society of Charleston. Dear board members, uh, the Preservation Society of Charleston is opposed to this requested special exception to allow a vertical extension of the non-conforming north side setback at the rear 34 Savage Street. Our concern is the consideration of the reasonableness of the addition, both in terms of intensification on this property and impacts to the adjoining property to the north at 36 Savage Street. This is a small lot and the proposed addition would be a significant addition of mass on the property, which we are concerned would have a detrimental effect on the neighboring property. Um, and it's not an air minute. what was your recommendation? Well, uh, I was interested in hearing uh, the status of the discussions with the neighbors and seeing if there was any opposition to this. I wasn't sure about that. It appears that there's no opposition from any uh, neighboring property owners. Um, and so I, I think, again, the, the critical issue is the light and air impacts on the adjoining property. That's the, that's the, uh, applicable part of the special exception test, uh, I think, for this application, and uh, and I'm I'm supportive of this. I think they have done a good job in trying to minimize the impacts and and protect the neighboring properties. So you are in support, Mr. Batchelder? Yes. yes. So the city recommends approval. Is there any discussion? I'm sorry, Would, could I see the slide that had the perspective views again? Yeah, that one. And so is it my understanding that the Preservation Society is opposed to the mass of the addition? Is that what I understood? I believe so. That's what they have written. Um, they say our concerns stem from consideration of the reasonableness of the addition, both in terms of intensification of this property and impacts to adjoining property. Um, this is a small lot, and the proposed addition would be a significant addition of mass on the property if we are concerned. Okay, thank you. So the property that they are referencing is, um, I think, according to the letter, the intensification of property and impact on the north property, which is Mrs. Lewis's property which the property owner and the architect have been meeting with, but she had no comment on whether she supported the project or didn't support. Is that what we were told? I think Ms. Spino mentioned that. Right. I, perhaps Ms. Spino could respond to that. Ms. 
Ferro, are you there? I believe that is what Ms. Fenno testified to. I think she said that they had been in discussions, but that um, but that the neighbor, Ms. Lewis, had not um, registered an objection or approval. And so, if I may, I just want to make sure the only variance being requested here, Mr. Batchelder, is is to the 55% lot, lot occupancy total rather than the 50% limitation, but the existing occupancy is already 52% with the existing shed. That's correct. And the vertical extension. And the vertical extension. Right. There's a request for both a special. Oh, I see there. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, Mike Robinson, I'm in a position to, to vote for approval. I think the applicant has reached out to all the neighbors and uh, apparently is satisfied with Lewis's uh, concerns and has they have the, the neighbor to the uh, east. So I, I move for approval. Robinson is that for approval of both special exception and the variance? Both, yes, sir. I'll second that, Allison Grass. Ms. Grass seconds the motion for approval. Any discussion? Well, I, I still have a little concern about the 36 Savage even though we don't have anything for or against, I do feel like there is some impact on that property. And I, I have a little concern about the, the same issues that the Preservation Society had. Um, and I, did Ms. Fenno, we have nothing from the neighbor at 36 Savage? That's my, that was my main concern, really. I think I can get, uh, Ms. Fenno on to speak if you give me a chance, if, if you'd like to hear from her. Why don't you try, Mr. Batchelder? Okay. Hello? Yeah. Mr. Batchelder? Yes. This, this is Becky Fenno. Um, thank you. Yes, we, um, Mrs. Lewis was actually the first person that we spoke with back in December when we started this project uh, and she originally gave consent uh, mm -hmm. and then and then uh, and then approached us with some concerns uh, that Mr. Batchelder as Mr. Batchelder mentioned we originally had the the second floor was on top of the same footprint of the first floor so it went straight mm -hmm. up from the dependent so then when you moved it back she seemed when that we seemed to satisfy yes. her yeah, she seemed to, um, you know, we spoke with her a number mm -hmm. of times and we moved it back and we explained it to her. Um, we spoke with her architect uh, and and honestly that then, then we didn't receive any further uh, objection from her. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fenner. Any further discussion? There's a motion uh, uh, that has been seconded for approval. If there's no further discussion, would you please say aye if you are in favor of the motion? Ms. Grass? Aye. Mr. Judon? Aye. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Ms. Richards? Aye. Mr. Robinson? Aye. And the project is going to abstain to avoid the possibility of the appearance of a conflict of interest. By a unanimous vote, members voting in present, uh, the motion is carried and the application is approved. And that is approval of the variance and the special exception. Uh, 
Mr. Batchelder, is there any further business to come before this meeting? Yes, sir. That concludes the meeting. Well, I'd like to um, thank everybody for their cooperation. I'd like to thank the city staff for doing a, a great job of putting this meeting together and uh, doing the preparation. And uh, I think as a chairman of the board, I can speak for all of its members and tell you thank you for a job well done. Thank you. Thank you. We'll thank you. be back uh, again at the same place in two weeks. Yes, sir. June 16th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.